I want to welcome you to today's message, which is from the book Firm Foundations. And this week it's about sin. Last week we were talking about man, the week before the Bible, before that God. And next week we're going to be looking at Jesus and salvation, repentance and faith conversions, assurance, the Holy Spirit, and prayer. So these are the doctrines that we're going to talk about. It's very, very um, foundational teaching, which I believe we need in the Gospel. These are the primary issues of the Gospel, not the secondary issues. And there is a great deal in the secondary issues of the Gospel that unfortunately affect a lot of people and cause a lot of division in our Christian faith through the churches. And so this is an attempt to just help people to understand the primary stuff there will be uh, secondary issues that we'll be dealing with in another book, but again, that will possibly be a little bit controversial of what we write because the churches do actually see things slightly differently. But the most important thing are the primary issues, and that's what we're tackling today. So today, it's all about sin. That word, sin. So this is introduction to study four, and this is about sin. It's totally disastrous that man has rebelled against his creator God because God in his absolute holiness will not tolerate sin and therefore God must condemn someone who's sinning. So as a result man is guilty, confused and separated from God. That's what happens. The best way to describe our situation is like this. Sin is like a great bottomless chasm that's opened up between God and ourselves and needs to be dealt with. We've got to recognize our condition before a holy God and our need of a saviour. And there is something that we call the offence of the cross. And this is where it really starts. When we start talking about sin, people start to get a little bit fidgety. And as they start to get a little bit, I mm, don't know if I like this, I don't think I'm very comfortable with the way he's talking about this. And they don't really want to be accountable. This is the trouble. We don't want to be accountable to a holy God. And unfortunately, we have a, an issue with something that keeps us and separates us from God. And so we, we need to come to this point of recognizing our condition before a holy God. So we, we need a bridge between our sinfulness and God's holiness. This is the problem. There, we can't bridge that gap because this is what we have in our lives. So man has in effect five real enemies uh, and these are first of all number one Satan or Lucifer better known as the devil and his demons the fallen angels secondly we have sin and transgression which is the act of sinning transgression which is the breaking of God's law so sin came into the world through the devil's temptation number three is the world in other words society that is hostile to God and his people then number four, the flesh, or sin as a desire. It's a desire within man's human nature in that man has a personal sinful bias, a depravity which is the cause of all sinning, breaking of God's law. And then number five, death, man's great enemy, which um, we believe is gaining victory through fear. Sin we know entered the world through the devil and then sin became universal in the life of man through the fall. We sin because we're sinners and without God we are depraved by his standards. Number one, Satan is the tempter, the deceiver, the father of lies. He is a real enemy and the Bible tells us um, that he prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. 1 Peter uh, 5 verse 8 but another temp subtle temptation when we sin is to blame the devil or demons and, and suggest that everything is his fault but we sin because we've chosen to so we can't blame the devil the devil's always going to be around and his demons are going to be there to tempt us and cause us to sin and and you know but at the same time it's our responsibility in the same way that Adam and Eve had responsibility to follow what God said and prioritize what God said to them rather than listen to another voice. And this is the problem. We listen to too many voices. And you know when people are really confused when they're listening to everybody and anybody's voice and getting advice uh, from all sorts of places. Um, it's not a question of, of you know, taking counsel from several 
people that are wise. It's about looking for answers that actually make us feel better and uh, make uh, looking for answers that, that um, are for our itching ears, as Jesus called it. And so we've got to be aware that um, you know, this is something that we choose to do. We, we can't blame God because there's a tempter. Um, we do this because we fall into direct conflict with God uh, and, and that's what's happening. So we have sin, we have transgression or sinning and it's often defined in the Bible as the act of breaking God's law. We have transgressed. And it says in Numbers 32, 23, you will be sinning against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. So it's further defined as enmity with God, as rebellion against God, and as falling short of God's standard in our lives. And we would say, um, to help us understand it and not be so sin conscious, we would talk about the fact that we are missing God's mark. You know, this is, this is how God has given us a standard his standard, and when we miss that standard, then, you know, this is when we've sinned. So we're missing the mark. That's really what it's about. Unfortunately, we tend to blame all our enemies too much, which is a subtle temptation again, and we need to take responsibility for our own sins. So we face persecution from the world. That's the next thing. Jesus said, all men will hate you because of me. Matthew 10, verse 22. It's often hard to live a godly life because of the world's opposition to the way that we live and work and socialize. Sometimes we blame the pull of the world and uh, we tend to compromise with the world in all manner of important situations when we should really be standing firm for God either for or against the world's stance and especially on views on anti-Christian matters. However, we should always do it graciously as we are able. We have to be careful. We don't want to be having overkill here. And you don't need a shotgun to kill an ant. So we don't need to get all passionate and worked up and angry and upset with people when they don't uh, understand what we're trying to tell them or when they don't agree with us. We, there's no need for that. We should turn from all violence. There shouldn't be any kind of violence as far as um, God is concerned with Jesus Christ, with the new covenant of grace, there is no need for violence at all. And any faith that is actually based on violence um, is obviously really wrong. It's not, it's not godly at all. <coughs> so how often can we say that people, even Christians, incorrectly excuse their anger and their actions um, by the so-called use of righteous anger? This is one of the things we've often been guilty of doing down through the ages is to say we have righteous anger and we have like the righteous war and you know th this is this is something that we have to be aware of um, we we're righteous by being vindictive or or malicious or to extract their our pound of flesh from someone you know we hold someone on a hook and uh, we don't we don't forgive them we won't let them go off that hook if they've done something to us that we don't like and we're we think is wrong, especially if we can back it up with anything biblical, anything that we feel God is behind us, we can get really self-righteous, incredibly self-righteous, and even as a nation we can become very self-righteous too. It's so interesting to see what's happened with this oil tanker business when we stop an oil tanker <laughs> by Gibraltar because it's going to uh, serve um, the terrorists with oil, we believe, and uh, and then so what happens is Iran then um, boards one of our tankers because it's near their territory. It's in international waters, um, but it's like they've done it exact. It's almost a mirror job for what they because there is a righteous anger. There is a righteous uh, anger in in terms of the, the British attitude that they don't want this. What the international community doesn't want this oil going to terrorist organisations which is quite righteous in itself, and that's very good. But there is also this self-righteousness that 
you know, we should be able to do what we want to do whenever we want it. And because we have a, our own country and we live in our own country and we've got armies and we've got all the things we want to do, we should be able to do whatever we want whenever we want it. And it doesn't matter if other people don't, don't like it. We're just going to you know, do the same to them that they did to us. And it's a measured response and it's almost like a mirror action of what we've done. And, and it's coming from a self-righteous position of national pride, and uh, you know it's going to get to a point where someone's going to get a bloody nose. Maybe the British, and maybe the Iranians, or maybe both. I don't know. And maybe other people are going to get involved. It could even be, you know, escalated into the next world war. You never know. All we know is that we don't have to worry. We can trust God for our future because we're safe, and God is really looking after us. And so we know that. Um, we haven't come this far to, to think that we're not going to be okay. God is going to look after us. And uh, we don't have to worry about what men can do to the body. What we have to worry about is what God can do to the soul and body. And so that's more important to us. That is our priority. But there's, there's very few cases of truly righteous acts of anger in the world, if you think about it. Because man has is got a distorted view of right and wrong. And true justice in acts of punishment or discipline. Just think about all the atrocities in wars around the globe. Many times these acts have been carried out through so-called justifiable retaliation because they themselves have been hurt. Also the atrocities committed due to an alleged holy war. I mean, we don't have to talk too much about the Crusades um, and about, you know, what happened with the Christians and the Muslims. There's, there's been a lot of bad stuff going on on both sides. We've had a lot of, of popes that haven't been you know, too holy and have caused major problems, you know. So we, we, we can't sort of say that we are the self-righteous, uh, you know, godly righteous people that, um, that never do anything wrong. You know, every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's so important to realize that. You know, we cannot call ourselves righteous. It's impossible to call ourselves righteous. We have got to claim our righteousness only through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our righteousness. We become righteous through him. That's what happens. And then number four, the flesh. Um, as a direct result of the fall, man has to face an enemy within his sinful nature. That's what it is. And in Romans 7.23, Paul says, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work in my members. So there's this other law that's going on. You know, he talks about what, what he wants to do, he, he doesn't do. And, and what he doesn't want to do, he does. So there is this sinful nature in man. This is what causes us the problems. So man has got this natural tendency towards sinful ways. And so he has to face the effect of this downgrading of his morals and ethics on a daily basis. Each one of us comes to a crossroads every day. We either follow ourselves or we follow God. It's a crossroad every day. Every person on this planet has a choice every day. And we don't suddenly have our brain taken out and a kind of, you know, bio brain put in there, you know, bio robotic brain put in so that when we get saved, we never do anything wrong. It doesn't work that way. But when we have our heart that's changed, then we have a different desire. We have a different, um, a different aim. We're, we're like an SSF missile that, that was just prone to getting it wrong and going into the wrong direction. And then when we get our heart is changed, it's like our, our guidance system is to try to honor God. So although we can kind of, you know, we can get it wrong, we ultimately we want to please God uh, rather than please man. And this is what's going on here. This is what Paul is talking about. It isn't just a mental descent to decide to follow the rules and regulations of your faith and try to please God by obeying rules because you'll never ever be able to do it. You can't, it's impossible to please God and, and obey all the rules. And so there is a need for a saviour. If we can't get it right, if we can't make our peace with God because we are good enough for God, then we have to rely on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to give us that righteousness through him because he was the perfect lamb without blemish. 
He was the perfect man that came to this earth and lived a s perfect sinless life. Otherwise, he couldn't have taken our sin. And therefore, because he was a perfect man, perfectly in terms of not transgressing, not, not disobeying God, the Father, he was actually able to take our sin on the cross uh, upon himself, which was why he was in such dire straits when it came to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, you know, if it's, if it's possible, can you take this cup from me? Because there's, there's a man who has never sinned, who has always honoured God, who is a perfect human being, and also perfectly God. He's never sinned, and he's now having to take on the sins of the whole world upon his shoulders. And he knows that he's going to be going to the cross to be crucified for that sin, to be punished for that sin. And so this is a situation where man has got this natural tendency, but God doesn't. So therefore, God is the only one that could intervene in that place. And because he sent Jesus Christ, that is how we, we have gained our righteousness, through his shed blood. That's our righteousness. Christ is our righteousness. So this enemy, like the others, uh, can only be overcome by the greater power of God in our lives. And then we come to the last, which is death, of course, the last of the five, physical death. This is man's last enemy. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, it says in Hebrews 9.27. Man is destined to die once. So we don't believe in reincarnation for a start. That doesn't fit with what we know of a holy God that has given man this life and this spiritual awakening and understanding. Man is to die once and after that to face judgment, says uh, Hebrews. So we also have to face this last enemy in others as we face this death through the death of our loved ones. So death is not just something we have to encounter, but we've also got to encounter it with the death of our, our family and friends and so on. So when sin breaks out into the open, it reveals itself in a variety of ways, sometimes in awful or shameful acts. But it's equally as powerful in the subtle undermining of the will, the motivation and the character of a person. So as a Christian person knuckles down and focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ, so his determination is given power to succeed and the fight against sin is, according to Colossians, we've just been reading, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So we do have a weapon against sin, we do have power over sin, we do have this resource from our Father in heaven that helps us to overcome, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. That's Colossians 1.11. So with the help of Christ, sin is to be rejected. Let me just read Romans, um, sorry, Hebrews I should say. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So th the help of Christ in that um, is what gains us our righteousness. So what are people really like? We're going to look at Romans very quickly. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Something's seriously wrong. When we look at people, something's seriously wrong. Just look at what God says through the Apostle Paul. This is Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So here we have that self-righteousness, which is actually unrighteousness. And that's how we suppress the truth, and that's how we justify that we can be violent, that we can be angry, that we can hurt people, that we can be vindictive, that, that we can go to war, and all these things is because we suppress the truth in unrighteous 
acts and unrighteous behavior, unrighteous attitudes. And so when we think we're righteous, we need to be careful. When we think we're standing firm, we need to be careful because how high the, the mighty fall, <laughs> you know, from how high do they fall? And so we have to think about that. Um, it goes right the way through to, to verse 32, so it talks quite a lot about what we should do. Let's just read some more. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they kno knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So it's pretty condemning on man and it shows man in his absolute depravity and it shows man in all the ways that he misses the mark with a holy God. So this is what people are really like. This is, this is the underlying problem that we have in the human race. This is the problem. So do you think this reading from the scriptures reflects that something is wrong with society? I'd ask you to think about that. Can you see any difference today? This was written 2,000 years ago, just on. And can you see any correlation to what's going on in the world today? Do you think there's something wrong with society? Do you think there's something wrong with people? Do you think we're getting better when you hear that, when you read that? There is so much that's going on today that is very similar to what's in there. It, there's nothing changed, really. So if so, do you think that God, what do you think God is saying to man at this precise moment? And applying God's word, we must naturally ask, what is basically wrong with the world today? Thinking of the natural world, we think of the pollution and floods and earthquakes and plagues and locusts, etc. And then thinking of human society and the events through history, wars, injustice and famine. Thinking in terms of antisocial behaviour. Surely we all accept that these things are abnormal. Man is an enigma in that he's capable of doing both good and bad. We have the presence of death. Think how neurotic we can become over death. Anybody here thought about death when they were younger? I remember when I was 17 being totally, totally terrified of getting cancer and dying when I was 17. Well, I've lived a few years since then. I had to leave that with God. But at the time, as an adolescent, without God in my life, I was terrified. And so people are quite neurotic today about death. That people can't deal with what comes after, so they just shut it off. And so that's why people get so uh, upset and worried and, and you know, start to really panic when someone else dies. <coughs> it, it, it brings them nearer to their own death. When we get, you know, the, the midlife crisis is all about that. People think a midlife crisis is just something that happens to people generally, usually men, 
but it isn't, it's men and women. And it gets to that point where <coughs> people think that midlife crisis is just all about being dissatisfied with their lives uh, uh, and wanting to move on or, and finding problems and not being prepared to, to carry on with the status quo that they had before. But uh, life crisis is a spiritual life crisis. And it usually comes because when people get past, it used to be 40s, and it's probably more like 50s now, but people, when they get to a certain age, they start to see over the hill. They begin to see pension. They begin to start thinking about, I know this because I used to be a life insurance salesman, <coughs> and people actually need to be backed up to the graveside and smell the flowers because we need to be able to deal with death. We need to be able to feel comfortable with that about death. We need to understand what death is. We need to understand that we have an eternal soul. And so what we do in this life will be measured as to what happens to us in the next life. And so this is important when we're talking about sin, that death comes into it. We can't just ignore it. We can't walk away from it. And many people who are, have a neurosis or who have mental health problems have got major problems around death they really find this an incredible difficult situation because they've never come to terms with it. So it can cause many problems and many neurosis building up in a person's mind and in their life and cause them to be very nervy about this and be, be terrified and frightened. So, you know, just think what we need to do. I mean, people even exhume or dig up bodies and do autopsies and all sorts of things uh, in efforts to, to try and you know, find a way of, of, of overcoming death. This is the problem. And think about the efforts that we can make to save life, freezing people in bodies, you know, fre freezing their bodies. Um, I can't remember the name for that, but uh, I, I, it escapes me at the moment, but um, there is a name for it where cryo... Cryogenic. Cryogenic, there you go. So we've got some good intelligent people, <laughs> thank goodness. So um, cryogenetics is where they freeze your body hoping that one day one day in the future that they can wake that body up again when they've got something, some new medication or some new surgery or some new way of, of being able to fix what was killing you and what, what caused you to, to die or, or just generally fix everything. Maybe we just need a complete recycle and a reboot. And I think that's what we get when we go to heaven. So it's not too bad. We get a new body. Yay! Uh, anyway, um, but these, this suspended animation, I mean, talk about it in, in terms of, of space travel. And we're looking at a documentary about Tesla the other day where something was supposed to happen with a, with a, um, <laughs> with a ship, with a, with a, with a Navy, and uh, where he, he had done something with um, electronics and electricity and uh, such amazing amounts of electricity that he, could, that he could put into this ship to try and cloak a battleship or destroy, I can't remember what it was, it was a, it was a big boat anyway. And uh, what happened, apparently what happened is that it did actually disappear um, completely. It didn't just cl cloak and stay where it was, it disappeared and it ended up somewhere else. And when it ended up somewhere else, what was purported to have happened, and I, I'm not, you know, I can't say this for sure because I wasn't there, but what apparently happened is that as it, as it came back into reality in terms of um, being able to be seen. Obviously something had happened to the molecules and some of the soldiers on board had actually been kind of integrated into the hull of the ship. They had been become part of the hull of the ship where it had come back together. And he was talking about time travel and all sorts of things. Tesla was an amazing genius. We can see some of the things that he managed to do. <coughs> it was incredible. He was well ab uh, uh, you know, ahead of his time. But the point is that we we are so worried about preserving life and winning wars and preserving all sorts of things that we, we kind of lose sight of what's that. It's all about our fear of death. Even in psychotherapy, we talk about the death instinct. You know, that you know, when you're a child, when you're an infant, you see your mother and your father and they are like gods to you, Mini G. They are like gods because your life is in their hands and if you've got parents that are fighting and 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 violent towards each other it, it can really really wound you deeply in your psyche because you could die 
in that process. And so when there's violence going on, it can really affect you deeply in your psyche. So we are almost consumed with this from birth. It, it's something that you know, we live to die. Everything in this life lives to die. It all has a time. You know, Ecclesiastes said there is a season, you know, turn, turn. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a time. There's a time for man to live. There's a time for man to die. So some try to get in touch with the dead through mediums and spiritualists. And, and this, we know, is expressly forbidden in the scriptures. We're told we must have no dialogue with the dead, and that God abhors witchcraft and spiritualist practices. So this is totally alien to a holy God, really. And we have to be very careful. And that, that's pretty direct, and it's, it's quite conclusive. These activities are non-Christian, regardless of what they profess to be. Someone even told me once that the word occult just means hidden. You don't have to worry about the occult. It just means hidden. The word doesn't signify anything. And there's lots of good in the occult. And I'm like, are you serious? Are you really serious? You know, I wonder what they said when they were, when they were sacrificing bodies and children to Molech. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> occult, it, it's, it's only hidden. We just don't do this publicly too much. It's hidden. We do these practices privately. So don't worry, it's just hidden. Well, the word is very clear. It says that anything that is right should come out into the light. So there is a sense in which things that are hidden aren't necessarily good, and we need to be a bit aware of that. And then our natural instinct is to avenge murder. That's interesting, isn't it? So there's all our righteousness coming all at once. The non-Christian responses uh, basically are a lack of forgiveness. We want to murder people that have murdered other people. And so there's something... A little bit strange about that when we think about it. Let's just read Romans again, chapter 3 and verse 10 to 18. Let's read uh, what it says here. Um, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So there's the answer right at the end. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so this is something we have to be aware of. If there's no, no fear of God, and yet, we need forgiveness, and to be forgiving too. So there's something totally contradicting in how we're supposed to be as believers when we're acting in those ways, when we have this instinct to pay back, or to, to get our own back, or to get revenge, or, you know, it's, to it's not Christian, it's wrong. The Bible says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's in Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So people who come to me saying, well, I'm quite intelligent, I've got this PhD, or I've got that, and I've got this, and that. And it's like, yeah, but have you got any wisdom? Because, you know, the wisdom of the world isn't necessarily the wisdom of God. And so people that have got high intellect and are really clever people, people like Tesla, I wonder how close he was to God, whether he was with God. I'm not sure about that. I haven't worked that one out. But, you know, we have to understand that man's intelligence can be frustrated and the people who are simple and who just trust God for their future can be made wise. I'm a living example. I've become wise because I'm intelligent? No. <laughs> Did I deserve to be wise? No. But I've become wise with God's wisdom, not worldly wisdom. By world standards, I'm not wise. By world standard, people will probably say, well, you're not that bright, you know. How did you do in school? Well, I failed my 11 plus. <gasps> What? How did you do that? You know, so what are you doing now then? How come you're teaching us? How come you're telling us about the things of God if you failed your 11 plus? You know, I've got a PhD, I've got an MA in this, and I've got an MA in that, and I'm, by world standards, I'm a very intelligent person. So what are you telling me? How are you actually being able to teach me anything? Where do you think you are coming from? Who are you? Well, I'm nobody. I'm just a person who God has called to do his work and do his will. And in my simple 
faith. God has given me wisdom through his word to be able to apply his word, to apply this to my life. Have I done right all through my life? No. I've done things wrong the same as everybody else. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. However, my heart is now to serve God and to follow God. That's where my Exocet missile aim is at. It's to serve God. It's to try and be the person that God has called me to be. So in the end of the day, this wisdom that comes to us, it came through the fear of God. Fear in a, in, in a, in, perhaps in a different sense to what other people. I have awe of what God is able to do in that he is able to destroy my body and my soul, whereas man can only destroy my body. So there is an awe that God is potential and what he can do, but there is also a, a reverence because of his grace and his love towards me and the fact that he, he is not going to smite me down. That he is going to continue to love me because he's my father in heaven. And that has happened not because of my efforts and because I've become wise in my own strength. No, that has happened because I have understood who the Lord Jesus Christ is and that he is the one that gives me the wisdom. He is the one that has reconciled me to a holy God. Not my own efforts, but the efforts of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his shed blood, I'm cleansed. And that I'm actually elevated now to a saint in the kingdom of God as a joint heir with Christ. Why? Because of my own intelligence? Not a chance. Not a chance. It's only through what he's done for me. And that's the same for every believer. It's not how good you are. You are never going to get to heaven on how good you are. So forget even trying. Don't even talk to me about it. It's a waste of time. You are wasting your energy. You are wasting your time. You will only become good when your heart changes and you acknowledge and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour and then he becomes your Lord because your life is changing, your heart is changing and your desire and your aim is to serve God and love God. And that's why you start to love other people because you, your heart is changed. So this is what happens. So how does Adam's sin affect us all then? First of all, it affects us in Adam's headship. He was the representative of man. I think I covered some of this a little while ago. But he was the first man. And if you read Romans 5, 12 through to 19, you'll, you'll, you'll understand that. Therefore, we can see that sin is imputed to us through Adam. Sin is imputed to us through the first man, Adam. He fell, therefore we are born corrupt. That's the way it is. It, we have that sinful nature, it's in us. Because he sinned as our representative, we are guilty in him. Original sin, this is called. We inherit his pollution. It's the DNA of man once, they were, once man had fallen. We have got that inherent in us. It's something that happens to us. Psalm 51 Let's just read Psalm 51. What Psalm 51 says, if I can find it. <coughs> Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And there are people that say, well, how can you say a baby is sinful? How awful is that? Fancy saying that. Well, it's a sinful nature. We're not saying that babies are terrible and we should, you know, get rid of them. This is a sinful nature that we have. You don't have to teach a baby to cry. You don't have to teach a baby to act out. You don't have to teach a baby to do things wrong. It's part of us. We learn by our mistakes. And you know, a baby starts to feel even even in our psychology we we understand that there are psychological splits that take place around about three months and six months and certainly about a year old with attachment theories and so on and so there are psychological splits in our psyche and you know baby gets angry with mum good breast bad breast we know about that you know when the breast is supplying milk it's good and baby's happy and baby thinks it's part of mum so it's not unhappy when it's getting what it wants 
but when the breast dries up, then it's bad breast and baby gets angry. This is the theory. And so, you know, where does that come from? How would it know? And this is what you have to work out. That there is, a, there is something in us that is inherently sinful. There is something in us that we need to understand is there right from the very beginning. It's going on all the time. Then we have a, a mind that, that works out and, and makes decisions and judge, judges all sorts of things. We, we have to, to actually learn and grow. And so we're all in sin today, even though we may think that we are good people. We've got this inherent sin, so we have the propensity to sin regardless of what we think we are. And we may have some, some illusions about the fact that we are great, that we are wonderful, that we are really pure people, that we are never going to, you know, we're never going to do this and we're never going to do things wrong. We haven't done this and we haven't. But in actual fact, we have this in us, whether we like it or not. There is a natural way about our sinning. People generally regard themselves as normal, don't they? Most people would say that they're normal. But if, let's just look at Romans and see what it says once more. Romans 3.23 says, <coughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what it says. All. Not one of us, not a few of us, not majority of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what kind of person am I, we might say? Remember that we're now speaking of our nar natural sinful condition in Adam before we come to Christ. First of all, if we look at Ephesians, we can see that we are separated from God. Let's just look at Ephesians very quickly. <coughs> Chapter 2, verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Well, that's pretty conclusive, isn't it, when you think about it? We're separated from God. There's no doubt about that. It's very conclusive there. We are separated from God. We're not in a position to be at peace with God in that position. And then we know that we are ignorant of God. If we look at 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 14, that explains quite well. 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So in other words, it's no good battering someone with all the, all the things that you know about God. It's no good battering someone with scriptures and, and different things and, and making them try to get them to understand. Intellectually, they may understand what you're saying, but spiritually, they need spiritual discernment. There needs to be something happen with the person so they can understand spiritually. That's the important thing. And so there is a sense in which even very intelligent people reading the scriptures are still ignorant of God. This is one of those things. 1 Corinthians 2.14 2.12, sorry. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So this is, this is what we need to understand, really, that we are hostile towards God. And so this spiritual discernment is so important. This is why we need to read 1 Corinthians 2.12 and 1 Corinthians 2.14 to understand why we have this hostility and why it's no point getting angry with someone because they don't understand the things of God. We have to be patient. We have to be loving. We have to help someone to be in a position where they can receive. The most important thing for us is to say, look, okay, you've done it from your angle. You've done it. This is what I say to people. I actually suggest that you, you may have actually got some form of kind of pick and mix religion that you have chosen to believe God in your own understanding and you've got this kind of pick and mix, mix faith. And how about you start off from what God has given us, first of all, from the Bible and go there and start to really try to understand God from his perspective, first of all, like a window to look through at God. 
uh, and, and just give it a chance. Just forget about all your preconceived notions, all your preconceived, you know, judgments of, of you know, who you think God should be. And God is made in my image. I'm not going to be made in his image. If, if we stop that nonsense, if we humble ourselves a little bit and go back to and ask God, what does God say about me? And um, what do I actually have to understand about God? Uh, we, can, we can stop being ignorant and we can really understand who God is. We can really begin to understand how God explains himself and it opens us up. The scriptures is the way that we find faith. It opens us up to God being able to do a, a, a real work and rev revelation in our, in our hearts, in our minds and understand. So let's look at Romans 5.10. Do we keep the Sabbath? Well, there you go. Some people might say yes, some people might say no. But Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we're incapable of pleasing God really. We may think that we're good, but are we really even keeping his Sabbath holy? He said six days you shall labour and on the seventh you rest. Well there's people that were Seventh-day Adventists say the Sabbath is on a Saturday. That's not my problem, that's their problem. But, you know, I know that the first day of the week was when the Apostles met together with the churches, and that was Sunday, and that was what became the Sabbath. It changed from the Jewish Sabbath to the Christian Sabbath. It, it changed. It was still the seventh day uh, in terms of, um, you know, God had ordained a day to praise, to praise Him, really. And, and the man was made, wasn't made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. So the Sabbath actually is very important to us, it's to give us rest. It's to do two things, to give us rest and to help us to have time to reflect more on the things of God and to worship God and to serve God in a deeper way. So that's what it's all about. Anyway, I'm going to move on because we're getting on with the time. So we can't please God by merely obeying his law. That's the important thing, which incidentally is impossible to keep perfectly. We need to be saved by faith alone. That's it. That's in a nutshell. So I'm going to just give you the readings you can continue with because I need to start getting to the end of what we're saying here and finally give you a complete picture. So first of all, we know that we're, we're helpless to reform. If you read Isaiah 64, verse 6, or Romans chapter 5, verse 6, we are helpless to reform. And we are utterly sinful. Sin has affected us in every way, in our mind, affection, and will. We have the potential to commit all sins. Read Matthew 15, 19. I'll just read that one because it's a quick one. Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. So this is what we need to be aware of, that this is what's going on. We are dead in trespass and sin. It's like saying um, the difference between sin and sinning. Sin is something that we have inherently in us. Sinning is something that we do today. Sinning is something that we do um, and we break God's law ourselves. So this is, it's the desire that causes the act, the sinful nature. We're even told that if we think lustfully, it's as if we did it by the act because thought gives birth to sin. And so we have to be very careful. This is the problem. So how do I stand before God Almighty? As a sinner in the eyes of God, what is your condition and what can you expect? Just think about that for a moment. The answer is that without Jesus Christ in your life, you are guilty. You are to blame. Everyone stands alone in their guilt because of the sins you commit. So we have original sin where you sinned with Adam in sense in that you share in his guilt and you have this bias towards wrong. You lack the inclination to, to do right in the eyes of God. That's the point. You are guilty because you're a lawbreaker in your own right. So you are a sinner because sin is in you, but you are guilty of breaking God's standards or missing the mark of God because you are a lawbreaker in your own right. 
you choose to do what's wrong. If you've broken one law, as far as God is concerned, as no matter how small that law is, if you've broken one law, then as far as God's covenant with man is concerned, in effect, you have broken them all. You have no excuse. So if you had a contract, let's say you were at work, and you had a contract of employment, and at one point in that contract you broke the contract, you did wrong, and you didn't do what the contract said, you would be guilty of breaking the contract. It wouldn't be a case of, well, I only broke it at that bit. <laughs> You'd be that's it, you're guilty, you broke it. The contract then has been broken. And, and it's the same thing when we come to God. Unfortunately, man grades sin. God doesn't, we do. So we see certain sins as worse than others. Everybody has their own ideas of what sins are. So you might decide that one sin is ten times worse than another. But in God's eyes, sin is sin. Breaking his law is breaking his law. At one, if you break the law at one point, it's as if you've broken the whole thing. The contract has been broken. That's the whole point. The covenant is broken. And so, you cannot have an excuse. So, we can't say, well, I don't really need a saviour. I'm a fairly good person. I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do what they do. Oh, I definitely don't do what they do. But that's not a reality. You're fooling yourself. You have to understand that you are a sinner because of inherent sin, and you do wrong regardless, but you will only be judged and guilty on what you have done wrong. And if you've done just one thing wrong, then you have missed the mark. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's it. It's, it's that in a nutshell. That's all you need to know. So, and, well, people say, well, I haven't really done lots of bad things in my life. Okay. It's like people who come to me that are uh, f for, for psychotherapy. And they sit in front of me and say, well, I had a great childhood. My parents were wonderful. And you're like, well, why are you here? There are things that have gone on that have caused problems <laughs> in your life. You have interjected some stuff in your parents that you have accepted as normal. But in actual fact, you know what? They're not really very good. And they may be normal to you. And they may be good to you, but they're not good to other people because you have a bias towards that interjected stuff you've got from your parents that you think was normal. I thought my father was normal and he was mentally ill. It wasn't until I went to someone else's home and they s then I was affected by the fact that their father actually liked them. That I suddenly, at 11 years of age, started to believe maybe my situation isn't normal because I started to see that happening with other people's fathers and mothers. And so it, it began to make me think. So this is, where we, this is where we have to be careful. What you think is normal, there is no normal. It's subjective. So we have to be a little bit objective and say, what's healthy according to what we understand healthy to be as we understand more about the psyche and about how we bring up children and how we are with our partners and how we are with other people and promiscuity and all the different things that go on in the world and crime. And we, we have a way of trying to work out what is, what is right and just. Our British law courts are pretty good. They not, may not be fair, but they are just. And that kind of democracy of working out what is a just thing is something we all have to work with and we have to marry that up with what a holy God says about our laws and so on. Sometimes the law is an ass, but that's another story. <laughs> but the important thing to realize is that we're not just condemned for what we do, we're also condemned for what we think. Thought gives birth to sin. As far as God is concerned, you have broken God's law in your mind. How many times have you s murdered someone in your mind? Mm. sometimes we let that murder come out in words and we've slandered someone and we murdered someone in our words we may not have gone up and physically stuck a knife in them but we might just as well have as far as God is concerned it's still the same anyone getting uncomfortable here? ok, so you are condemned that's the point <laughs> so y and you can do this in the positive or the negative don't forget <laughs> I'll give you some scriptures. Read James 2.10, read Matthew 
5, 27, 28, and Romans 5, 20 and 7, 9. So if you can read those, it will, it will convince you and you can understand a bit more. It's a bit of homework. So, for example, you are told to love your neighbour. So it doesn't have to be in the negative. It's not because you've done something terribly wrong in terms of hurting someone. But what about the positive aspect? You know, we're supposed to love our neighbours. It says, do good to all people, especially to the household of God in, in Hebrews. And so this is something we need to understand, that it can be the sin of omission, not just you know, causing offence and, and being a problem. So you are condemned, that's the point. John 3.18 and Romans 3.18 and 6.23 in that you are liable to all the miseries of this life and death itself and the pains of hell forever. You're ripe for final judgment. So that's not a very good prognosis, I have to say. I'm not very pleased to have to say that to everybody, but that is the condition that I have to realize that I was in. Before I came to Christ, I knew that that was my condition. I knew that God had shown me that I was in need of a saviour. And I didn't understand the depth of my depravity until I started to read God's word and really understood how much I needed a saviour and how much of a sinner I was. But once I realized that, and I threw myself on the mercy of God, and I asked God to show me, to reveal himself, to actually show me himself, to make me aware of who he was, so that I could really trust in him and understand what I needed to do in my life and how I was going to get right with God the Father. I asked him, how am I going to do that? Is there any hope for me? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in a bad state here. I'm in deep bankrupt the state of moral uh, uh, behavior and so on. I need to know, is there any hope? And the question is answered, you know, not from our side at all. So if you think you've got hope in yourself that you are ever going to be good enough for God, forget it. It's not going to work. It doesn't matter how good you think you are, you're not good enough because you will have broken God's standards at some point. So you can't be holy in the same way that he's holy. So and we can do absolutely nothing about that at all. We can't save ourselves, that's the important thing. But you know, the wonderful thing about God is that God is merciful and loving. However, there is a problem here. God can't let guilty sinners go free. You understand that? A holy God makes a covenant with mankind, makes a covenant with us, through Abraham first of all, and then through um, Moses and Joshua, he's, he makes this covenant of ca curses and blessings of obeying the law. If you, if you obey the law, you're blessed. If you disobey the law, you break the law, you're cursed. And so there's this covenant of the law through Moses. And he can't let a guilty sinner go free. If, if you've broken his covenant, his, covenant his, his contract, the contract he has with us, to be at peace with God, if you break it, you can't just say, oh, don't worry about it, you know. We have to, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That's why they did all the sacrifices before Christ came. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, there is no remission of sins. And so, he allowed us to be pardoned by sending his son Jesus. So God knows his children and he loved each one of us even while we're dead in sin. And it's God who works in a person's heart to change a person, reviving them spiritually, inwardly, to enable them to be saved. It's humbling, but nothing to be afraid of. All you can do is throw yourself, like I did, on God's mercy and to continue to seek his way of salvation for you. That's all you can do at the end of the day. There's nothing more you can do to earn your salvation. You haven't got enough money to buy it. You can't do enough good things to balance the scales to do it. Because if you've broken the law, that's it. You've broken the law. So God expects you to accept his sacrifice. He had one true sacrifice. The only sacrifice that was going to be acceptable to God was his own son, 
who died on the cross for you. And his blood covers your sins. Through him you have forgiveness of sins and life eternal. Amen.